You found us. Uh, it's the Richard and Judy Book Club in association with W.H. Smith. And we're about to talk to an author that we've, uh, we've spoken to uh, here before uh, about his first factual book that we, uh, we put on our list, the Richard and Judy uh, list of great reads. It was Operation Mincemeat. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read it. And it went straight to number one and stayed there for months. It was an absolute smash hit. It was the story of the true story of how the British Secret Services managed to fool the Germans into thinking that the Allies were going to invade Greece rather than Sicily, around about the midpoint of the war. Uh, and it was crucial to the success of, of those landings. Well, that was like for starters. The big one, as I'm sure most of you know, was of course D-Day in uh, June 1944. And there were only two places that the world knew that the Allies were going to land. It was either going to be in the Pas de Calais or it was going to be in Normandy. We all know now that it was Normandy. The trick was to persuade the Jerrys that it was going to be Calais. And it was done beautifully and successfully by a bunch of crazies, a total bunch of crazies. And the man who's told the story, again, is Ben McIntyre. They were sort of freaks. The, they were. The, the, the Secret Service operatives who were, who were kidding the Germans. They were. I mean, I've often wondered whether this particularly strange part of espionage attracts a particularly eccentric figure or whether it actually just creates mm. born eccentrics. But I, as I write in the book, I mean, this was probably the most eccentric military unit ever assembled. <laughs> they were the flotsam and jetsam of occupied Europe. Yeah. There was a failed Spanish chicken farmer. There was a bisexual Peruvian playgirl by the unimprovable name of Elvara de la Concepcion Chaudoua, <laughs> um, who was fantastic. But, but these were all people who had been recruited by German intelligence mm. and then turned by British they intelligence. They were double agents. They were double agents. Which, mm. And the double agent is the most valuable ace in the pack for any spy master. Because the other side believes what they're being told. That's right. But can you tell me why would somebody turn like that? Because it must increase the risk to their life and mm. limb enormously. Hugely. <laughs> They had different motivations. Some mm. were motivated by ideology. Some were genuine anti-Nazis. Some did it out of greed. Yeah. Some did it out of a sense of adventure. They're not traditional heroes, no, these no. people. They don't no. really slot They're into misfits. our idea. They're misfits. One of them actually Oddball. set out to join the German secret uh, service, the uh, Abwehr. The Abwehr. The Abwehr. With the end game in mind of becoming a double agent for the British. Hilariously. Yeah. And he couldn't get himself recruited. <laughs> he <laughs> kept offering him his services to the Germans and they kept turning him down on the, on the entirely sensible grounds that he was completely nuts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but eventually he just decided to go freelance. Was, so he the, was he the same guy that once the operation, and we'll, we'll come on to this, to persuade uh, Germany that uh, the Allies were going to invade the Pas de Calais mm. <laughs> rather than Normandy, was he the guy who incredibly bravely flew back to his German handlers when they had doubts about him? That was a uh, different one. Oh, go, that was a different one. That was, tell that was the story, one called it's Agent Tricycle, who That's in right, some yeah. ways is the most important agent of yeah. all. I mean, he was the one. He was a, he was a, a Serbian playboy, uh, a wealthy international businessman with, with roistering habits, who had been recruited by the Germans very early in the war, then decided to turn over to the British. And he was the only one who flew back and forth between Britain and his German handler in neutral Lisbon, mm. feeding misinformation directly into the heart of the German intelligence. Face to face. System. Face to face. It was incredibly brave. He made 13 trips. And, uh, what, and as I remember the story, at, at one point, uh, his handlers in Germany were getting very suspicious. Very. And the British said, look, you better not go back, because they're probably going to torture you and kill you. Yeah. But he went anyway. He went anyway. What a I brave mean, man. Well, he was a, he was a supreme actor, too. I mean, he loved the idea of being kind of <laughs> The, the high rolling figure and one has to bear in mind that on the German side particularly in his case in Tricycle's case there was a willingness to believe on the German side partly because they were incredibly corrupt they were making thousands of pounds mm. out of these agents mm. because the agents were being paid by Berlin but the spy masters were raking off Taking money off the top. the top so you've got this strange confluence of factors yeah. that actually means that in a way the, the cards were stacked against the Germans mm. So, so you mean so in Berlin they'd be giving, handing out all this money, but it would go via the, go handlers. Via the, the handlers, handlers, and they would, like an agent, they'd take commission. 15%. Yeah. Well, illegally. They Ill weren't supposed no, no, to. No. They just <laughs> raked it straight off the top. I mean, Popov's handler in Lisbon was running a, a bought a villa and a Rolls Royce <laughs> with the proceeds that he'd taken off Popov. So, I mean, it sounds humorous, but one has to bear in mind the stakes here. Mm. because you're dealing with very fickle human material. Mm. These are all double agents. Now, somebody who's changed sides once can change sides again. Mm. And, and the, spy, the British spy handlers were plagued by the fear that mm. if one of these agents, 
if just one of them was actually a triple agent, was actually working for the Germans. The whole thing would be blown. The whole thing. And, and the cost in human lives mm. would have been incalculable. Well, let's, talk, let's move on to that. I mean, it is an intensely colourful story, but as you say, the stakes were phenomenally high. I mean, if you like, the future of civilization as we know it rested on the outcome of the invasion in, in, in 1944. And had the Germans not bought it, or had one of the agents gone triple, and, uh, and they realised that we were going to land in, in, on, on the beaches of, uh, of Normandy, we would have lost the war, wouldn't we? Because Germany would have moved everything into, into that part of France and knocked us back into the sea. Well, I mean, that is the, that is the sort of $6,000 question, really, is that had the Germans rumbled that this was a hoax, they would have reinforced the Normandy beaches. There's mm. no doubt about that. Mm. I mean, they were pretty heavily defended anyway, bear mm. in mind. It was a bloody fight. Let's not pretend that it was a walkover when they arrived. Yeah. But had they known what was coming, they would undoubtedly have reinforced the beaches. And it's highly likely that the invasion would have failed. Now, that, the knock-on effect of that is almost incalculable because this is what Hitler was expecting to happen, to roll back the invasion. He would then have concentrated his, his forces in the east, smash the Red Army was the plan, at which point all bets were off. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would have taken, he calculated, and he was probably right, at least a year for the Allies to mount another invasion. Mm -hmm in which time anything could have happened. So you're absolutely right. I mean, the course of history was fundamentally mm. changed by D-Day. But the deception was so extraordinarily successful. It wasn't just that, uh, that the, the, this, this, this spy network persuaded Germany that uh, Pas de Calais was, was going to be the, the invasion site. They even said, but there will be an invasion in, uh, on, on, in Normandy, but it's a hoax, so don't react to it too much. Yep. And even 24 hours, 48 hours after the real invasion, Hitler was saying, no, 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 they're coming to Calais. That's they're just a, that's a feint. Even longer than that, six weeks oh, after God. the invasion <laughs> uh, in Normandy, the mighty 15th Army, the mighty German 15th Army, which was massed around Calais, was still waiting for an invasion that never happened. <laughs> and what's more, they were so delighted with what they perceived to be the brilliant work of their spies in Britain that Garbo, the character I was telling you about earlier, the failed Spanish chicken farmer, was awarded the Iron Cross six weeks after D-Day for having been such a, a splendid man and giving such great information to the Third Reich. It strikes me that you're... I mean, you, you, uh, you write incredibly well, but your real talent is in actually bringing us these... one, Like you did yeah. in Mincemeat and now in Double Cross, these amazing characters who actually probably wouldn't have flourished in any other time except war because they were so peculiar. Mm. But actually, in war, we owed them everything. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I think war creates opportunities for the most oddball and misfit characters to find a niche. These were people who really wouldn't have fitted into civilian life in any normal way. I mean, they were really tremendously eccentric, but this was their opportunity. And I think, in a way, their very colourfulness sold them to the Germans. They seemed so extraordinary and so sort of extreme that you couldn't make it up. And I think it is that old thing that, you know, truth really is stranger than fiction. Yeah, and what happened to them after the war? Well, they all went in different directions. Some, I mean, uh, one became a sort of housewife in Michigan and never told a soul what she'd done. Uh, Popoff, the flamboyant Serb I told you about earlier, he capitalised on it. I mean, he, he wrote a book kind of exulting in what he'd, he'd done during the war and, and indeed elaborating on it somewhat. Uh, they chose different paths, really. I mean, a couple did continue to work for the intelligence services mm. for a little while afterwards. But really, as we said, war was, war was their... Their time. Was their, once it was over, there was really not much that they could do. It was do. their kind of landing on the moon, really. That's it. And they That's were recognised. I mean, they, got, they were given medals, some of them, but in strict secrecy because mm. they could never reveal what they'd what done. They no. mm. what, the one final point is how incredibly intellectual and sharp and uh, almost like a, group of, a small group of geniuses were the British Secret Service handlers. They really knew their stuff, didn't they? Well, they played a was, blinder. They did. And this was really Churchill's inspiration. I mean, Churchill had a policy of employing people who didn't think in straight lines. He mm. called them corkscrew thinkers. Mm. He liked people who could look round corners and think round corners. And so he assembled in the British Secret Services, for this very brief period during the war, a set of people who, who, who really were quite extraordinary as a combination. And they, they, they cooked this thing up, and it was fantastically elaborate. I mean... The files now released into the National Archives on which this, this book is based are very voluminous. I mean, mm. the files for Garbo alone, one of the agents, are, is literally four feet high, mm. which gives you an idea of the sheer complexity of what they were doing. And, and one final point is they were not only just using real agents to send disinformation. They began to invent fake sub-agents who didn't exist at all. Mm. And Garbo alone, this agent, had 27 sub-agents, none of whom existed. <laughs> 
<laughs> but all of whom were feeding this vast scree of disinformation back to the Germans. So in the end, the sheer volume of it was such. Do you think, finally, in the, in the world of the internet and, and the high-tech world we now live in, such an operation would be possible again? I think it would be very, very difficult yeah. to carry out something like this, partly because the British had one inestimable advantage, which is that they were reading the German private mail. Through Bletchley Park, through the intercepts of Bletchley Park, they could work out in real time almost mm. what the Germans thought of their own agents. So they had a kind of backstop check yeah. on what was going on. Yeah. You wouldn't have that today. And no. that, that is a circumstance that's never happened before in history and probably will never happen again. But that said, the way that spies are recruited, the way that agents are run, the way that agent handlers run them, that has probably not changed mm. very much. Those are, are principles that yeah. still run today. Mm. Well, it's great to see you again, Ben. Lovely Congratulations you. on Operation Mincemeat from a Thank couple you. of years back, and I think this is going to be as a big a hit as, as that was. Um, yeah. Double Cross, Ben McIntyre, the true story of the D-Day spies. As with all the books uh, that we recommend through WH Smith, um, there's all the extra stuff in the back. There's our question and answer sessions uh, with the writers. There's how to download the, uh, the podcasts. And, of course, we now have our book club app. Uh, you simply download that onto your smartphone, take it into WH Smith, point it at one of the books that we recommend, and it will pop on the little screen telling you all about the book and what we think of it. And it's uh, usually pretty good stuff, as this certainly will be. Lovely to see you again. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Really good story. Thanks very much.